This medical school has been an overwhelming success, not in dollars and cents or exam scores, but the fact that we've got these you know, phenomenal physicians that are working in small rural communities that are socially accountable, uh, that are working really hard to, to make the communities that they live in better. And uh, where NOSM has succeeded is uh, approaching medical education for Northerners in a really unique way. And that's being immersive and, and not doing things the easy way, but doing things the right way. So immersing um, students in rural communities, immersing them and teaching them how to be community-based leaders um, and, and sending them to all kinds of places that were difficult to get through to due to economics or to transported access. And uh, continually they just found ways to overcome those barriers. So a lot of the experiences that were, I think, very difficult, whether it would be, you know, being eight months away at a CCC community, uh, at the time, that, that was a challenge. Um, but who I am as a physician uh, is, has been so shaped by that. And it's the same with the um, 106 placements where you're, uh, you do um, one of the immersive community experiences in an uh, Indigenous community or an urban uh, Aboriginal placement, uh, those are so formative in, in how we practice, how we uh, care for patients, and how we've been able to be hopefully competent providers in, in Northern Ontario. A lifelong learning process is, is cultural competency, and I hope that, uh, that I'm a continuing and evolving culturally competent provider, but it's hard, right? You can't learn that in a classroom, in an hour lecture, you can't learn it. Uh, over six lectures, I, uh, I think the most important part is be immersive in communities, work with Francophone populations, work with Indigenous populations, you know, learn from people who do it really well, and uh, hopefully be a, a good listener and have humility. And I think if you can listen and have humility and realize that your practice is continually evolving, you can you can do your best to be a culturally competent provider. I learn all the time from my peers, I learn from my colleagues, I learn from interprofessionals, and, and most often I learn from community providers, right? People who are, who are doing things effectively. So I work um, and have done clinics at our, our local friendship center, and it's only you know a half kilometer from our clinic but one of the things that the people who run the, the Dry Native Friendship Center have told me is that people feel much safer there. You know, there's a community lunch, there's a feeling of community-based care, and they're much more open to accessing health care there than they are in a traditional health care setting. Uh, so, you know, one of the things in listening to them was, was just running clinics at the, the Friendship Center and not letting kind of barriers and obstacles to doing that get in the way. And I found I would see patients and care for patients in a place that they felt safe and, and the, you know, the interactions were completely different. So, uh, so that's, been, uh, that's been really illuminating. I've also learned a lot from my colleagues in Sioux Lookout. Uh, you know, I've had great um, classmates and people I went to residency with and, and they've taught me a lot about being you know, culturally competent and if I have a question I call them up and I ask them how they would deal with a, a challenging situation and they've, they've taught me a lot and hopefully I've had that humility to, to listen and to be open to, to continually changing the way you see the world and the way you practice. One of the things that I was asked to be involved in through the, the Native Friendship Center was uh, they wanted to do some recreational programming and I, I love sports and I believe athletics and extracurricular are kind of a an avenue to being a successful adult. So the person who was running this was having a, a hard time with coming up with activities. And I said, oh, I'd, I'd love to help. Uh, and the, fr the Friendship Center has a great approach to inclusion. It's just not for Indigenous kids. It's not just for Francophone kids. Any kids that want to come and play basketball or floor hockey or tag or any of those things, they just want to create an open space for that. And that's really was their vision. So, um, so I, I agreed to help, and when I could, I'd rush over from clinic, and we'd play basketball or floor hockey, and and I would uh, take great joy in in competing, and and um, it was a lot of fun, and I would bring my kids along too. Ultimately, I ended up seeing one of those families in the emergency department a couple months later, and uh, and usually these are sometimes encounters where. 
the patient doesn't have a family doctor, they don't feel safe in the emergency department, they're sick, and in this case, the mom was sick. And uh, as soon as I came in the room, the little guy, like, just lit up. You know, he was about eight years old. He knew me right away. Of course, he, you know, um, started teasing me about how he had beat me last time at hockey and how I was a terrible hockey player, which is mostly true. And the mom could see that her son was really comfortable and she knew that I had run these, these uh, uh, or had helped run these, these uh, recreation nights doing these different sports. And immediately there was a totally different context to that encounter. There was trust there. Uh, she trusted me. I, I trusted her. I knew she was this great mom who had, had done a really good job raising this nice young man. And she had a serious illness. But, you know, I also had the understanding that she had to care for these kids. So in someone who I would have previously said, no, you got to get admitted to hospital and you got to do this. We had the trust to come up with a plan that allowed her to stay at home. Um, and I knew that if she got sicker, that she would come back. But she also didn't have that complete disruption of having to be admitted to hospital and have someone else care for her kids and things like that. So that experience I had, not as a physician, but just someone helping out in the community, helped really change the, uh, the encounter I had in, in my job as, as a physician. It was really powerful. It was a, and, uh, it was a, a wonderful experience to see how that, that community-based experience was helping me be a better physician, I think. Theme one uh, is, you know, laying the groundwork for what, um, you know, the best things that NOSM can provide, which is a, a context to be physicians who work in their communities, who live in their communities, who make the communities that they live in better. And if I think of um, Dr. Cook, who's my colleague, was the year behind me, you know, he coaches uh, his kids' soccer teams. He's running a walk with a doc program. He's uh, going out and doing community-based lectures at uh, Eagle Lake First Nation. Um, you know, we're both NOSM grads, that's been ingrained in who we are, right? So uh, I think it's, it's so integral. So our job is much, much more than showing up to work, at, you know, eight to five and running a clinic or, you know, working in an emergency department. We're, we're physicians and we're seen as that 24 hours a day in our communities. And uh, it's a great privilege you know, I think rural communities is a place where physicians have this um, this wonderful standing. People appreciate the work we do. They they have a lot of respect for us, and there's um, there's a lot of trust that still exists in that patient physician relationship. And, and in other settings, I think that's eroding a little bit. So it's it's a great privilege that we're still afforded that. I think if you're going to survive in, in rural communities, you have to have effective interprofessional relationships. Um, we have, you know, wonderful relationships with our interprofessionals and we're so dependent on each other. There has to be a lot of trust there. So an example is optometrists in rural communities really function as the backstop for emergency eye care. You know, um, you're a generalist, you're not an expert at everything, so you, you rely on your interprofessionals. So whereas if I was in a large city, I don't think I'd have a, a close relationship with an optometrist necessarily. I might have an ophthalmologist I refer to, but here in, in Dryden, our optometrists help us in so many different ways that, you know, we'll call them at home. They give us their home numbers, and at 9.30 or 10 at night, they'll crawl out of bed, and They'll, they'll come and look at a, an acute red eye, an emergency eye case to help us out because we're, we're struggling. Or, you know, it's maybe our physiotherapists who, they, who come and, and help us out with um, ambulating someone in the emergency department that we're worried about. Or our, our uh, PSWs and our nurses who deliver home care. And ultimately, right now, we're in a situation where we don't have enough doctors, so we rely on their assessments you know if someone writes me a letter or calls me up and says you know mr mr jones is not doing well i think something's wrong you know i see him three times a week and he's just not himself well, we take those those assessments seriously and we um we try and help out in a way that's the least disruptive to that patient so um, i think of the nurses who work in ignis and they're an hour away and they have me on phone and text and 
and they take great care of my patients in the home setting and they do everything. They work at the clinic, they, they see the patients in home and, and they uh, really are my eyes and ears and I trust their assessments implicitly. So if they're worried about someone, I'm worried and, and uh, I think that trust is really special. So uh, you're gonna learn your whole career uh, that you don't know everything, you don't have to know everything and just have the humility to be open to, li to listening and learning. And, and learn from everybody, your, your colleagues, your peers, uh, the interprofessionals, learn from patients, right? I've learned a lot from um, how I've treated patients and how, the feedback that they've given to me and the mistakes I've made. Um, so I think if you're, you have that humility um, and you're eager to learn, you'll be a, a really competent physician.